Without any further ado, she is the Vice President of Sustainable Development at the World Bank Group. Please welcome up Rachel Kite. I was waiting for some theme music then. <laughs> I actually asked my staff what the theme music should be, and this is going to date me, and probably none of you will even know it, but I, my favourite so far is The Tide is High by Blondie. Uh, <laughs> uh, we've got to make sure that that tide goes down a little bit, and I'll come on to that in a moment, talking about disasters. If one person can make a difference, absolutely. Uh, if that one person is Mike Bloomberg, and he's the mayor of New York, and New York City is losing um, jobs and at an incredible rate on a daily basis in the teeth of the financial crisis in 2009, April 2009, and the entire economy of the city is up for grabs, and he still decides that he will push through new building regulations in New York that eventually, now, just four years later, have reduced um, uh, or have improved efficiency from buildings by uh, well past the target that he set. I think they've achieved almost 30% efficiency from certain kinds of buildings. And he did it in the teeth of a financial crisis. Yes, one man can make a difference. But that person might be the farmer that decides to plant a different crop. It might be you. Uh, it might be me. One person can make a difference. Education. I, I think that uh, one, of the, one of the things that I see is that none of the solutions, and the solutions are at hand, the solutions are not, not, not unknown in many cases, but most of the solutions are multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary. Um, and I think that that's still very difficult to get your head around or get an exposure to in the current education system. We tend to teach water engineers a certain approach to water. You're going to be an effective water engineer today, then you need to understand pathways of urbanisation, you need to understand climate science, you need to understand agronomy. I mean, there is no one solution that one discipline is going to be able to find. And working across disciplines has been something that has bedeviled academia since it ever began and c continues to bedevil it today. It's one of the biggest struggles in organisations like mine, is how do we work together in teams bringing different disciplines. If you're a small farmer, if you're a householder in a slum, in a city somewhere, um, no one engineer is going to solve your problem for you. You're going to need a, 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 an approach which understands how you are managing your budget, managing your land, managing your inputs, managing the weather, managing your family, managing the education expenses. I mean, your life is complex and we're not really taking that into account. I think, the, how, do you, how do you educate the media? Um, I think one very big problem we have is how to communicate science. Most scientists, I'm not a scientist, so uh, I excuse all of you who are, I mean, the, the need to be specific, the need to hedge, the need to, you know, reveal probability, etc. This is difficult to communicate. Um, just look at the communication over the last 10 days since Typhoon Haiyan hit, hit the Philippines. Can we say that that one storm can be attributed to climate change? No. Can we say that the ocean off the coast of the Philippines is higher today than it was 20 years ago? Absolutely. That's measurable. We have the data. Can we say that the ocean off the coast of the Philippines is warmer? Yes. Does that mean that the storm surge was bigger? Yes. Does that mean if that same typhoon had hit the Philippines 20 years ago and today, it would have had a different impact? Yes. Is that due to climate change? Yes. But how to communicate trends, how to communicate scientific data is really important. It's even more important in countries where science itself is being challenged, where science itself is seen to be up for grabs. And there are certain societies where the role of science in informing policy is up for grabs. It will be your generation that has to turn back the tide. We need science to inform policy, and then we need good policy. Short-term narratives, absolutely. And there are really good short-term stories to tell. This is a negotiation about gases. 
It's about carbon, it includes methane, includes hydrofluorocarbons. There are things that we could do tomorrow to take methane out of the atmosphere. It's an accelerant of long-term climate change. It is a short-lived climate pollutant. You can get results within days, weeks, months. Not covered in the convention is soot, black carbon, the stuff that chokes children, the stuff that lies over crops and, and decreases their productivity. If we could take car black carbon out of the atmosphere, which means changing people from bad cooking stoves to clean cooking stoves, which means getting rid of diesel engines, which means stopping forest fires, if we could do that, we could have a huge impact on the speed with which we are arriving at two degrees. So there are things that can be done that give you a short-term, immediate climate benefit in terms of slowing the rate of change, but would also clean the air so that kids don't choke in the playground and they don't have to play inside. That mean that you can commute to work without getting black on your face. That you don't take a selfie with your iPhone in a city in northern China and not be able to see yourself. Right? These are short-term impacts with what we call health co-benefits, which have productivity co-benefits and will slow the rate of climate change. And then you talked about not being able to tell the story of win-wins. So the greatest win-win is agriculture. And we're not even talking about agriculture. I don't know whether you're following this, but the negotiations have punted, uh, which is a tactic used by most English football teams when we're playing Poland. Just kick the ball all the way up the pitch. Um, we're not very good at ticky-tack in England, as you know. Um, but they've been punting the negotiations on agriculture from one scientific meeting to another scientific meeting to another scientific meeting. Why? Well, some people have genuine political concerns that if we talk about agriculture in the climate negotiations, we're going to start talking about putting emissions targets on least developed countries at a time when the, the developed world has still not come through on what it promised. But if you leave the negotiations and you go into the real world, agriculture offers what we call a triple win. It offers the opportunity to increase yield, which is so important because we have to feed a growing population on, according to climate change, less productive land. We will need to use genomic research, as we do today, to produce varieties in, uh, of, of, of different crops increasingly food crops, not just wheat, maize and rice, in order to feed that growing population with nutritious food. We don't just want to fill stomachs, we want to fill stomachs with vitamins and minerals and protein so that kids actually learn when they go to school. But Climate Smart Agriculture offers you the opportunity to increase yield, increase income, if you intercrop between trees and fruits and trees and grains, if you use trees to protect the riverine, the, the, the river banks around your property, if you use drop per crop, new low tech irrigation technologies, you can actually reduce emissions from the way in which we're using the land. In climate change, most things are a trade-off. Agriculture is a win-win-win, and we're not even talking about it. So I think that you're absolutely right. We've got to find ways to bring these messages forward. And then you talked about solutions and the problem that it's still perceived as a development versus climate debate. I, I'm more optimistic. I think that that was the case. I think, you know, in the World Bank, we're a development financial institution. And uh, for years, it was like, you should not be talking about climate change because you're a development organization. But increasingly, we have understood, and we are not alone, that we cannot eradicate poverty extreme poverty measured by an income of a dollar twenty-five cents a day unless we grapple climate change because while six hundred million people have been lifted out of poverty over the last twenty twenty to thirty years they will not continue to stay out of poverty nor will their neighbors follow them out of poverty if climate change means that we're going to have intense droughts every two years rather than every five years in the Sahel, if we're going to have intense droughts in the Horn of Africa 
every uh, 10 years as opposed to every 20 years. If a country like the Philippines is going to be buffeted by Category 5 storms as opposed to Category 3 storms as frequently as it is, and lose percentage points of growth every year. Because when you lose that growth, it will be the poor and it will be the vulnerable that suffer. So I don't think it's a trade-off anymore. I think it's a case of you cannot guarantee long-term development anymore unless we grapple with climate change. And by the way, we will not be able to grapple with climate change unless people are empowered and have access to finance and land so that they can choose to use the light emitting diode solar lamp rather than the kerosene lamp which chokes them and which makes their kids ill. So we have to have both. So we, we believe that we cannot solve for climate change without poverty. We can't solve for poverty without climate change. These two things are inextricably linked and they are the moral challenge, challenge of this generation. I was in uh, Boston just a few weeks ago with the privilege of listening to Rob Sokolow speak. Professor Sokolow is the man who invented the wedges. So this idea that you know, emissions come from energy, from transport, from agriculture and forest and land use, etc. Which is the way in which we frame our, th our, our journey for solutions. Now he's 75 now and retiring. And he's one of a generation of scientists across the world who in the late 1960s came to the beginning of their professional academic careers as physicists and as chemists at a point in time when the world, when that generation, the generation before, just before me, was becoming aware of environmental boundaries, of environmental crisis for the first time. This in the United States was the era of Earth Day. This was in Europe the, the birth of the World Wildlife Fund, the birth of Friends of the Earth, the birth of Greenpeace. These scientists, who are now 75, are turning around and saying, we're done. We have done amazing things in our lifetime with science. But now for all of those of you who are at the beginning of your careers, you have to think about what are you going to do in the next 50 years. So he was saying, look, you know, over 50 years, this is what we've done. And he referred to a moment in 1969 when an elderly professor put his arm around his shoulder and said to him, over my lifetime, we have stopped nuclear war, but we have not found a way to produce energy from nuclear fission or fusion safely. This will be your challenge. And the thing that I'd like to think, if we're going to build a movement, the thing I'd like all of you to think about is what are the challenges that you are going to solve in your generation the next 50 years? And in 50 years' time, as Rob Sokolow threw down a challenge to my students, Rob Sokolow said, and you should be thinking, in 50 years' time, when you are standing here or you are standing in the negotiating hall or you are reporting out, what will be the challenge that you will throw down to the generation that comes after you in terms of what will still be left undone? But what you will have had to solve for are many of the challenges still unknown, still to be decided within the climate context. That is your challenge. So I just want to end by talking about disasters and money, because that's what's being negotiated across the road. So how many of you were born after 1985? Oh, God. <laughs> Oh, that's really depressing. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so in 1985, I was young. I was a student. And in 1985, the world was transfixed by television images of the Horn of Africa and the great drought there. Fiona, my colleague, was running around as a radical journalist trying to mobilise the whole of the South Pacific, Australia and New Zealand around this issue. Um, since that date, since that date, the costs of natural disasters have quadrupled. In your lifetimes, the costs of natural disasters have quadrupled. Now we understand what climate change is going to do to intensify natural disasters, 
we have to start asking ourselves, how can we afford this? Not just in terms of human tragedy and human life, but how are we going to be able to afford this economically? What's being discussed over at the convention is loss and damages, and who's going to pay for it? What we've been doing is bringing to the conversation evidence that you can reduce the cost of loss and the cost of damage by investing in resilience. But this comes back to the point you made about short-termism and long-termism. It's like buying life insurance or buying health insurance when you're in your 20s and young and you can drink 16 pints of beer and still get up the next morning for a lecture. I can't do that anymore. You, don't, you put off until tomorrow what you don't need today. We need to invest in resilience today. And the costs of that are going to have to come from development finance, from your taxpayers' money when you pay um, in a developed country for overseas development assistance. It's going to come from climate finance, which is going to come out of your taxes as a developed country, and increasingly from other countries. And it's going to come from humanitarian assistance. When you pick up your cell phone and you type 55505 in the response to a disaster call. So you're paying for this, and you're going to pay more and more and more for it. Unless we, unless we build what we know about resilience into the way in which countries develop. We know that for every dollar that you invest in early warning, early warning systems, right, that the, the, the sirens go off, there's a tsunami coming. The, sound, the, the sirens go off because a typhoon is, is, is changed course. For every dollar invested in early warning, you can save up to $35 in the cost of reconstruction. I would put it to you that you have an absolute material as well as moral interest in how we sort out loss and damages. And that's just on building resilience. That's not even addressing the question of who is going to compensate for entire societies when they have to move because their agricultural systems can no longer grow effectively or be productive at 4 degrees centigrade or at 4.5 degrees centigrade or at 5 degrees centigrade. And that's being discussed. And I think that uh, for your generation, and for my generation, and for my kids, climate change is redefining what it means to be in solidarity. I think climate change is redefining what it means to be generous. Because if we're going to pay for all of this with some line items in our budgets, wouldn't it make sense to do things which mean that those line items are not going to get bigger and bigger and bigger? And that brings us back to the obligation to mitigate and the obligation to reduce emissions. And what I see happening in the negotiations is this you know, mitigation adaptation on the one hand on the other debate is now becoming a much more emotive, much more difficult discussion around who pays in what way, when and how. Which brings me to the finance discussion. Making development resilient, raising a road up so it will be above the flood line, building schools so they don't wash away, putting a water treatment plant somewhere other than a floodplain, it's going to cost about 25% more. We estimate that every year a trillion dollars could be invested in infrastructure. That's the gap, the infrastructure gap. So that if you're going to make it resilient, then you're going to make it, you know, a trillion and a quarter. And of course you want that infrastructure to be green infrastructure as well. You want to be building geothermal power plants and not coal-fired power plants where you can. Or if you're going to build coal-fired power plants, you want to do them with carbon capture and storage which is very expensive and technologically still not sound. Making the world resilient costs more, up front. But as I just said, it will, you will save money over time because you will save lives and you'll save money from that resilience. The costs of mitigation are also very expensive. And it will be us and you that are going to pay for this. And we can pay for it now and we can pay for it smartly. We can use public money to leverage the right kind of private investments. We can agitate with our governments to put a price on carbon, either through taxes 
or we can put a price on tarp carbon through a market trading system. We can do it whichever way, I don't care, but we better put it on now. Because every day that we do not price what is bad, we are simply storing up trouble for ourselves financially down the line. If you live in a European country, in the European Union, the probability that about 10% of your pension is invested in the oil industry and the coal industry is pretty high. What will happen if the value of that asset starts declining in the middle of the next decade? What's going to happen to your pensions? The sooner we act now, the better we will be off financially in the long run. This is about building a movement. You are the movement. As you said at the very beginning, every one person can make a difference. If you look at the examples of the women's movement, of the gay rights movement, of the movements that have transformed within a generation, not just what is happening in the world, but the way in which young people think about what their lives might be, then every single person has made a difference. I used to work for a woman who had grown up at a time when she could not go to law school. She grew up at a time where, as a Jew, she could not get access to certain buildings. She'd grown up at a time where she was stoned and, and vegetables thrown at her for defending uh, black men who were civil rights uh, heroes in the south of the United States. I, grew, I learned from a woman who, when she was pregnant and defending a black man in the civil rights movement, had to sleep on a bench in a railway station because no hotel would let her stay there. And she said to me, Rachel, you will face moments in your life where you stand at a fork in the road. And you will have a choice to do the brave thing, the courageous thing, or the other thing. If you want to make change, you're going to have to take the brave fork in the road. That's your challenge. Thank you very much.